and welcome to Rock Book Show, this special edition. We are here at BEA 2013, and I am with Vivek Tiwari, who is the author of this amazingly cool project, The Fifth Beetle. Thank you so much. Thank well, you. It's so nice to have you here. I guess the first question is, how in the world did you come up with the idea to do this as a graphic novel first? Well, you know what? Maybe we should actually talk about who Brian is. Sure. Who is The Fifth Beetle yeah. as... Paul McCartney said. Yeah. So Brian Epstein was the fifth Beatle. Um, he was the, the band's manager, and uh, he discovered the Beatles at a, a cellar in Liverpool. They were, uh, they were a popular Liverpool band, but no one knew about them anywhere else in the world. And, uh, and he, he had a real vision for them. He, he used to go around saying, the Beatles are going to be bigger than Elvis. So he was the first really to believe in that big vision. And he was the man that took the Beatles from that cellar in Liverpool and brought them to unprecedented international stardom. Um, he was the one that suggested the haircuts. He was the one that told them to put on suits. He was the one that allowed them to take off the suits and get rid of the haircuts and encourage them to pursue the psychedelic era and to, to make political statements and really push the boundaries uh, of their art. He always said that the Beatles are going to prove that pop music is an art form. So he was that visionary. He really was a business visionary. Uh, and that's why uh, I think uh, McCartney has acknowledged him as such, but why I also think he was the fifth member of the band. It might sound a little bit poetic to put it this way, but I really think he was the fifth member and his instrument was the business. Yeah. Um, and, and the business is really how you came to find him as well. You've been in this material for about 20 years. That's right, yes. I mean, lit literally for more than half my life, I've been <laughs> studying Brian's story. Uh, I discovered his story while I was a, a student at the Wharton School of Business. I was in business school. I was really looking for a business blueprint. I wanted a, a source of inspiration. I was a young man planning to get involved in the entertainment industry, and I thought that the Beatles and Brian were the team that wrote and rewrote the rules of the pop music business. So I thought I should study the life of Brian Epstein. And, you know, 20 plus years ago, there was no Wikipedia, there was no YouTube. Um, there were very limited resources to, to, to find information about Brian. And there were and still are no books about Brian Epstein currently in print. Why is that, do you think? Well, you know, the, the, the main sort of beats of Brian's, uh, the human side of Brian's story is that he was gay and Jewish and from Liverpool at a period where those were three significant strikes against you. Um, in particularly, being homosexual, it was against the law. It was a felony to be gay. Um, if it had been come to public light that he was gay, he would have been thrown in jail. So um, as a result of that, Brian had to keep his personal life very hidden. And back then, the press was uh, was much more, certainly the British press was much more respectful, if you will, than they are now. The British press now, as you may know, is very tabloid driven. They're very much about scoops. Um, back then, there was this, this sort of unspoken understanding that if you don't write about personal stuff that you may see or overhear, you know, we'll give you access to, to the Beatles and to the band. And so, as a result, people didn't really write about Brian. It was sort of, sort of, under, the people who knew understood that they had to keep it private or, or the guy would have been thrown in jail. So people just didn't write about it. The other reason is the part of Brian's management style was you concentrate on your art. You guys are artists. Explore the boundaries of your art. Don't even think about the business. I'll worry about the business. So he shielded the band from the business, and as a result of that, you know, Paul McCartney very famously called him the Fifth Beatle, but he, I think he did that in the early 90s. You know, it was 40-some years after Brian was working with them that, that, that the band finally started to acknowledge his role. And that's not because they are jerks and they didn't want to acknowledge his his role, it's because they didn't know. You know, he shielded them from that. It, was, it was, wasn't until years after he died and until they reached a point in their careers where they had to be businessmen as well, right. that they began to understand what it really meant to, to, to work on the business side of things. So, yeah. And other people have been called the Fifth Beatle as certainly, well. Certainly. I mean, uh, George Martin, their producer, has been famously called the Fifth Beatle. Um, you know, Neil Aspinall, who ran their uh, Apple Corps for many years, was the Fifth Beatle. And, you know, I don't mean this uh, in, a, in a rude way, but it's also there's always a matter of, of timing and what year is it and who's having an anniversary, who's just passed away, you know, who's in vogue to call the fifth Beatle. You know, I'm, I'm going with, with, uh, with partially what Paul McCartney said, which is if anyone was the fifth Beatle, it was Brian, <laughs> and also on what I believe, which is that he really was a member of the band and he played the business as his instrument. There would be no Beatles without Brian Epstein, at least not the way we know them. Or they might have never gotten out of Liverpool. I mean, you know, it's uh, so, so I really think he deserves that credit of being called the fifth Beatle. Yeah, it's a fascinating story. But to bring it in graphic novel form, I guess my first question, are, are you a comic guy? I, you know, it, it's my first graphic novel uh, uh, 
professionally speaking. Um, speaking personally, I've been reading comics ever since I was a little kid. Um, I've very often said that I probably learned to read by reading comics, so I am a comics guy through and through for sure. Um, so when I decided that I that it was time to tell the story professionally, um, I saw it in, in in color palettes. You know, it starts out in 1961 Liverpool, which is very um, dark, industrial, depressed. Um, so it's very black and white, if you will, you know. And the story ends in 1967 London, which is very bright. It's the summer of love. It's, uh, it's the dawn of the psychedelic era. It's very technicolor, if you will. So I saw the story as one that moved from black and white to technicolor, sort of. Um, but by thinking of the story in color palettes, it made immediate sense to me that this belongs in the graphic novel medium and in the visual arts medium and film. It was always envisioned as both, yeah. as graphic novel and film. And that works really well right now. Um, the Walking Dead is a great example sure. of that, being able to stand on its own in both genres. Sure. And that is a very important thing that you just said, being able to stand on its own in both genres, because I, I very specifically want to say, for the record, we did not make a graphic novel in order to make a film. The graphic novels are not storyboards for the film. They're two very separate projects, and they do stand on their own. There's, you know, as a huge comic fan, there's certain things you can do in the graphic novel medium that you can't do in film. And similarly, in film, there's certain things you can do that you can't do in the book. The most obvious one, and the one that I'm most proud of, is in the development of the film, we have secured rights to Beatles music. We got the approval of the Beatles and signed a deal with Sony ATV, who control the Lennon-McCartney music publishing catalog, and so we're able to put Beatles music into our film. By the nature of the medium, the book can't sing. You know, the book is static. Maybe one day with digital books and stuff, we, we will see more, more audio. Um, and, and we're actually hoping to do something pretty, pretty interesting with the audio, with the digital version, I should say, of the Fifth Beatle book. But that's one thing where film can do that, obviously. And because we have rights to the music, there's going to be lots of music in the film. Um, so that's one, one where, uh, area where the film will be very different from the book. Well, and as you mentioned, the the way that the book progresses from the black and white to yeah. the Technicolor, so then the choice of your artist was very important as well. Yes, very much so. And I, and I should say it's not quite that extreme, but the book really does start in very in monochromes. It's very black, grays, dark blues, rain rain colors, industrial colors, and it does end very vibrant, bright, very Technicolor. But it's not quite so dramatic as black and white to color. Um, but it does really sort of follow that. And yes, the artist was very important to me. I am a writer. I am not a, an artist. I can't draw to save my life. Life. And so, uh, so I really wanted to work with somebody who could um, could capture that very painterly style that I had in mind, but also somebody who was willing to put in the work to make sure that he captured the period right. It is a period piece um, about iconic figures, so he needed to capture the faces accurately, but also the architecture and the co the the the, um, the wardrobe, the mini skirts that you see in the 1960s. You know, you, we needed to capture all of that. So it was very very important. Very early in the project. I met Andrew Robinson, who is the primary artist on the project, and um, Andrew's work is beautiful, as you'll see. I'll show you some of the book. Very painterly, and he can capture that that pure talent, artistic side that I wanted. But Andrew also loved the project. He loved the script. He loved the idea, and was really willing to put in the time to do that research. Or, or I, you know, I, said, I I helped him. I gave him a lot of reference materials. But he really wanted to put in the time to get the faces right and to get the architecture right. And you know, so so it became very clear early in the process that Andrew was the best guy for it. Um, we also have Kyle Baker, um, who is a very, uh, very famous award-winning uh, cartoonist, and Kyle is an old friend of mine. And Kyle grew up uh, with these Beatles cartoon, with the Beatles cartoons, and so Kyle is doing a, a, a sort of insert into the book, a, an eight, eight to ten page sequence um, that really covers uh, the band's time in the Philippines, and is done as a tribute, a sort of an homage, uh, a style to the old Beatles cartoons. So very, very different from Andrew's work. Yeah. Very cool. So when does the book come out and where can people learn more about it before it is released? Yeah, thank you for asking that. So we, we have a website. It is www.fifthbeetle.com. Uh, and it's also Fifth Beetle, uh, at Fifth Beetle is our Twitter handle. And so we're very active on Twitter as well and on Facebook. Um, so please do follow us and, and, uh, and, and like us on Facebook and visit the website. And you'll find out a ton more information, breaking news on the film, all sorts of things like that. Uh, and in terms of release date, we're actually announcing tomorrow here at Book Expo uh, that the book will be coming out on November 19th. 
Um, and uh, it'll be coming out everywhere, bookstores, comic book stores, online, all over the world. We're very excited about it. And we're also releasing three different versions of the book. The regular version will be 1995, uh, and all three versions are going to be hardcover uh, and oversized to show off the artwork. Um, there will be also what we're calling the collector's edition, which will be $49.99 and will include a 25 pages of uh, bonus materials, um, some design sketches, alternate covers, um, a mem uh, basically an art gallery from Andrew, Andrew Robinson. And as I mentioned earlier, he really did spend a lot of time wanting to get the faces right and get the, um, the period right. So the art gallery is actually pretty interesting because it'll show you his process and how he studied it and how he got it right. Um, there will also be a memorabilia gallery that I've put together over the years um, of really interesting Brian Epstein uh, memorabilia. And these are like, it's Beatles memorabilia that a lot of Beatles fans haven't seen because it's really more leaning towards Brian. Um, to give you a couple of examples, um, Brian's business card, which was given to me by one of his be Brian's best friends, um, a Christmas card that, that was given to me by Brian's assistant um, that he sent out to his staff. Um, Brian encouraged John to, to pursue his literary interests, and so John wrote a book called In His Own Right. And when the book was published, Brian threw a big party for John uh, to commemorate the book, and so I have the invitation to that party and the seating chart, which includes everyone from the German ambassador to Mary Quant, who invented the miniskirt. So some really, really interesting pieces of memorabilia. So the additional materials are actually very cool. And that um, the collector's edition also has a special cover, a sort of canvassy textured cover that's a little bit more elegant, a little more suitable for, for your library, if you will. And, um, and then finally, there's also going to be a limited edition version, um, $99.99, uh, so a much uh, higher price point, but it's also limited to 1,500 copies only. We're only making 1,500. They're going to be signed and numbered, signed by myself and the two artists um, with an exclusive piece of art at the front and also in a slipcase. Um, so it's going to have everything that the collector's edition has, but a few, few extra very, very special things. And uh, 1,500 only of those. And yeah, so all you know, three will be released on November 19th. So. Nice. And you have Beatles people kind of like their collectible stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I'll be honest, uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan first. I am a, a geeky fanboy, and, uh, and that's the version that I would want. So I really thought about, like, you know, what would be the version that I would want to buy? And so that's the one that, that's the one that we made, and that would be it. So. That's the one. And the film. Tell us when that's yeah. coming. So we've been developing the film for a few years as well. The, uh, the big news on the film is that last year, uh, after working on it, I think I might have mentioned this earlier, after we, um, we secured the approval of the Beatles and signed a deal with Sony ATV, who's the publishing company that controls the Lennon McCartney catalog. So we have access to Beatles music for the film. We are literally the first film about the band in history to have gotten those rights. Um, you may know there are other Beatles movies. There was Backbeat. There was a recent John Lennon film called Nowhere Boy. And previous films about the band have gone without Beatles music because they weren't able to secure those rights or, or make that deal. We did. Uh, it took us two and a half years, but we did it. So I'm very, very proud of that. Um, and between the music rights and the graphic novel, we, um, we have a lot, a lot to talk about. Uh, I have adapted my graphic novel into a script that's also um, been reviewed very favorably in Hollywood circles. And so we are getting a lot of uh, sort of, sort of A-list Hollywood interest. Um, so we're out to directors right now. I'm hoping within the next uh, several months we'll, we'll have more film news for you. Um, but the film is, is not a, it's not a dream, it's a reality. It's, it's very, very much in development. And, uh, and I suspect we'll have a little bit more, more, uh, more forceful news to release soon so wow, that is cool. fantastic well congratulations thank you. thank you so much the the book is out in november and november then look for the film shortly thereafter congratulations this thank is a so really much. really cool thank project you. thank you it is a labor of love for me so i love talking about it thank you so much for for being interested in helping us spread the word so.